Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 13. Um, this lecture is the last lecture covering the elastic wave propagation in our class. So here we'll mostly talk about the uh, signals at uh, with the different excitation modes. So um, the, this table shows the different kinds of excitation modes. First is the impulse, and impulse includes all frequency when broadband inputs used. Spectral response obtained from the FFT will be flat like this. And random noise, um, if it's a non-coherent noise or the white noise, also the edge of the spectral density will be flat. So that it means there are uh, many, uh, it's wide band, so it contains a lot of uh, wide frequency ranges from low frequency to high frequency and wavelet has a packet of the wave so with the uh, central wave and uh, with the uh, low frequency that conveys the um, the en main energy and sinusoidal has a single frequency and the amplitude and the phase is determined from the signal um, and by applying some you know, combining and synthesizing a signal with a different frequency, a single frequency, then you can have a sweeping effect. So the uh, sweep signal, sign sweep signal, looks like the uh, low and high and very high one, like this. Huh? Or it could be inverse sweep. Huh? So excitation, um, the, for the resonant testing, so you have to find the, uh, so in the resonant test, in frequency spectrum, we want to find the resonant frequency, uh, which gives you the uh, the peak amplitude. So then the frequency sweep or the random noise are used, huh? and mostly the first mode of the um, the deflection is uh, generally used, and the highest mode will be uh, limited by the uh, particle size and the conglomerate size. Uh, in resonant column test, boundary condition can be different. Uh, it could be a free free and a fixed free and fixed fixed condition. Um, and a fixed boundary is called the nodal point and a free boundary is unconstrained end. Um, and in the resonant column test, frequency sweep is typically used to detect the resonance and random noise excitation can be also used. Um, there are some papers that are using the, uh, the random noise. So this uh, schematic, this picture shows the resonant column testing machine. Uh, you can see that these are the uh, coils and inside this one is magnet. So by applying some known sinusoidal signal to this coil, this magnet will move uh, left and right, back and forth, and that applies the torsion with some oscillating oscillating torsion force to the specimen. So here with the signal generator, you can apply the sinusoidal signal to this coil and that, that generates the force to the magnet and so the magnet moves. And at the same time, you can measure the acceleration at the, uh, the driving cap. It's called, this is called a driving cap and you can see there are some acceleration, one acceleration, or you can use the two acceleration at both end. And this will be conditioned and then also it will be collected in the oscilloscope or eddy board. So then uh, from the uh, amplitude response or the frequency response, you can plot this kind of a single, um, the frequency response of your specimen plus this driving cap. And this frequency response changes with the strain. So when the strain is small, the strain is smaller than the threshold strain, then it will be a it will be a symmetric, it will be symmetric like this with the resonant frequency at the center. But as the uh, gamma increases it becomes more nonlinear. Okay, and how to do the data reduction? Um, in resonant column test, to reduce the data and the obtain the property or you know, parameter that you want, actually there should be some calibration procedures. Uh, 
Um, that starts from the boundary condition. So when you take the when you determine the velocity, um, the resonant frequency is directly correlated to the velocity of the the specimen. So to get the resonant frequency, you have to define and know the the boundary condition. If it's fixed boundary condition, the wavelength will be a uh, two times the specimen length. If it's fixed free condition, it will be a four times of the specimen. And if it's free free, then the, it will be two times of the specimen length. And if you have a uh, added mass at top, then the we will need the calibration for that using the Rayleigh. method could be a and in a fixed fixed or free free condition the velocity is given as like this if you know the um, the, the resonant frequency omega n then the velocity will be omega n times l over pi and the k for the first mode you can assume the k is 1 if it's fixed free condition then you multiply the also the k will be 1 and multiply 2 to this equation and here the l will be the specimen length and v will be the velocity of the well, propagating wave huh? um, it could be a longitudinal wave or it could be a, the torsional wave and when you have uh, added mass then you can see here this driving plate at as an additional mass then um, here the m is the mass of the specimen m naught is the mass added at the free end so if you have a specimen and this part will be the added part right and this will have uh, some additional mass m naught and also it will have a mass polar moment of the inertia of the added mass when when it's tor uh, when it rotates so uh, you need to know the m naught and uh, if you know the f the uh, omega n in the longitudinal vibration you can define the vl and if it's torsional vibration and you need to know the i naught and if you can define the resonant frequency then you can also calculate the uh, shear wave velocity um, and then how do we define the uh, determine the damping ratio <coughs> um, here damping ratio is computed from spectral response so in for example yeah this kind of a spectral response needs to be uh, calculated first from the measured response and once you have that, that kind of a frequency response, um, there are several methods. First is the single point method. So from the peak ampli ampl uh, amplitude of your frequency response, you can get the damping ratio. And uh, the widely used method is called a half power half power bandwidth method and this used the two points like this so the in the left side omega and omega and the right side omega and divided by the natural frequency and first resonant curve also you can use this method and mostly people and and the alternatively so these are the widely used one and the next one that's frequently used is the curve fitting to the response function. So using the H, the transfer function of the single degree of freedom system, you can fit the, uh, um, the data with the, uh, the curve and from that you can extract the original frequency and the damping ratio. So here the measures of spectral response can be fitted using risk squares with the response predicted for a linear viscoelastic system. So typically you will assume this kind of viscoelastic system. And um, the other method is that in the 
yeah, in this kind of a resonance system, when you apply some DC voltage, and then oh no, sorry, so when you apply the uh, this kind of a sinusoidal method, sinusoidal excitation, and then you just cut and let it spin and it will decay it will vibrate freely and then decay the energy right so then if you measure the acceleration over time after you cut the uh, circuit and you stop applying the voltage it's gonna decrease the amplitude will attenuate like this with the exponential function so then the uh, logarithmic amplitude decrement is given uh, will give the delta and from delta you can calculate the damping ratio uh, and this here the delta is called the logarithmic decrement um, then how do we compute the strain so in the g over g max curve the people the peop uh, typically use for the stiffness degradation curve and x axis the uh, shear strain, right? And it degrades, degrades like this. So then each measurement should corresponds to a certain shear strain, right? So then in, in the case of cylindrical specimen, as I told you before, it will have a stress gradient by this much. So then the representative shear strain is defined as the uh, actually square root of 2 over 2 times the r. So this is around 0.7 or 7 or something. So then in, in <clears throat> simplified form, and people also recommend, it, recommend to use the 0.8 r. Strain is average strain for the volume of the specimen. Then maximum, so to get the uh, strain, you need to know the this displacement and displacement can be obtained from the acceleration and the fre resonant frequency. And in the hyperbolic relation, the shear modulus, so this and uh, modulus degradation curve, this shape of the curve can be used, can be drawn or fitted using this hyperbolic relation and here the g max is the maximum shear modulus at here and the gamma r is the reference strain the effect of the strain dependent variation of the shear modulus along the radius has a negligible effect and small strain measurements of the stiffness can be accurately performed on the solid rust specimen subject to torsional ex excitation um, there are some comments by uh, from uh, selected from the literature about the resonant column test. Um, it's not easy to obtain the frequency dependent wave velocity and attenuation of the soil using a resonant column. At high frequency, the mode coupling and noise occurs, and at, in low frequency, the compensating mass of you know, the addition of the compensating mass or the electromagnetic inertia as the complexity so it's not easy to calibrate um, testing effect is soil also aged due to repeated excitation so the oscillation they like repeating the torsion makes the uh, specimen hardens or softens and uh, coupling between the specimen and the end platen can affect the measurement so in theory we are assuming that here is the fixed boundary and uh, here this driving plate is free but uh, we are assuming that the, uh, this cap and the top of the specimen are coupled fully coupled right but uh, sometimes you have a friction between the cap and the soil so that that affects the um, measurement restraint of the specimen due to end plate and membrane penetration effects of the transverse vibration the longitudinal axis of the specimen must be perpendicular to the pedestal 
pedestal and the top plate must be perfectly horizontal in practice the deviation take place and the transverse motion develop so that means that here you have a specimen and if there's some tilting of the driving the plate and uh, it will cause the transverse motion and it uh, will add some the significant noise to your signal and counter EMF effect is the, the vibration of the magnet relative to the coil produces the counter electromotive force. So even though you uh, apply zero voltage after some oscillation because of the, the residual movement between uh, relative movement between the coil and the magnet, it creates the counter electromagnetic force that attenuates fast, that attenuates the, uh, the signal fast. Um, the fixed end, the train of which the stiffness of the fixed end of the resonant column should be at least 10 times of the stiffness of the specimen and the three degree of the freedom analysis to interpret the material parameters. And coupling effect, source transistor coupling in resonant column is the interface between the top plate and the soil. Localized displacement may take place, may take place and careful examination of the each situation is warranted. Um, in the free vibration decay column, uh, it used the first mode. And uh, in first mode, free vibration decay testing or quasi static rotation or displacement is imposed on the specimen. Um, so it's like you have a. Um, see if I can draw it well. This is the steel cap, and uh, you can have another steel cap. And here you can uh, impact with some maybe hammer or steel ball, then they will generate the torsional mode, right? And, and you can measure the acceleration while it's vibrating. Then it's called a free vibration decay. So uh, you don't need any uh, the coil and magnet system. So then uh, quasi static rotation is imposed so that uh, you will have this kind of a the decay function with the exponential decay. And when you fit this decay and you can get the alpha or delta and from there you can get the damping. Um, so here from the alpha you can get the damping or the one over Q. And this method is very effective if you have a sample that can stand by a cell. And uh, the other method is the transient pulse method. So here the transient pulse method is like you have a source and a, a receiver type of the system. Source and receiver. And the challenging thing is determination of the T. Because you need to know the L and the delta T the travel time um, and T is fully defined concept in a low C dispersive medium and attenuate affects the high frequency more than the low frequency the peak of the spectrum of the signal shift to shift to lower frequency as the L increases and dispersion um, also the you have a dispersion as the so is dispersive media and different frequency component travel at different speed and there's a pure period in front of the arrival front that has very low amplitude and new field effect can also affect in especially the band element testing. And when you measure the velocity using the uh, pulse propagation method, so you're applying this kind of a step signal and the receive signal will be like this, then the picking up the arrival time and this will give you the group velocity. Um, first mode testing in resonant column and free vibration decay provides the phase velocity because you will have a certain frequency band. So for example here, the frequency band is very narrow that the frequency band is uh, in the 2 to 3 hertz or maybe 1 to 3 hertz. So the velocity that's determined here represents the phase velocity 
at the frequency of like 1 to 3 hertz. Damping ratio, uh, the attenuation is determined by the decay and amplitude with distance, but the uh, uh, only way I can think of is called the spectral ratio method. Mm. Here, um, I think the, this is uh, one testing method using transient pulse. You have a high uh, energy level, maybe it's a high the pulse signal. Maybe you can hit it with the hammer here. And then it will propagate through the rod and then bounce back. And they are at the free end, it's going to bounce back again. So this accelerate accelerometer will pick up the signal like this so first deflect 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 so it's like you have like this huh? and if you pick up the uh, the distance by using some auto correlation and you will be able to define the velocity of the medium. And the other method is, as, as I said, uh, to get the uh, uh, attenuation. Here we are looking at the uh, uh, amplitude decrease, amplitude uh, degradation over a distance. And when we assume there's no geometric damping. So when the geometric damping here, beta is zero, in the case we can just, so we, we, this is one, or zero, so zero, then we'll have amplitude reduction over the, the frequency and slope will give you the, uh, the damping ratio uh, so and the uh, the last one is the quasi static excitation um, so you can use the uh, coil and magnet system driving plate and apply sinusoidal at very low frequency to medium high or the medium low frequency for example if it's quasi static could be you can start from 0 0.01 hertz to maybe like 10 hertz um, and during this excitation this is the applied force and you can measure response or response uh, of the soil so how they the, in, in terms of the strain or it could be the, the force uh, uh, maybe the strain uh. So then from there, we can uh, draw the shear strain and the shear stress curve, which will be like elliptic like this, and the area will give you the damping rate. And also the, the slope of this, the straight line is the stiffness of your system. Um, so this quasi static excitation is for the very low frequency that's applied here and when the frequency becomes high then the, now it becomes the wave propagation um, thank you for listening